Okay, here we go. Welcome to Well, and today we're talking to Fred Bay. Um, you know, Bay's. I, I'm really encouraged. I'm really encouraged by the by the meeting that we've had over the past couple of weeks. Um, you know, it's, it's actually more has been has been has been more more fruitful than than I could have even imagine. And you know, and today on Well, we're going to discuss you know topics that we got into the other day. We t- <laughs> What, what I thought was going to be a 30 minute conversation last week turned into a two hour conversation of fellowship um, <laughs> with Fred that that was that was truly tremendous. And it opened up a lot of conversations that, you know, that I've you know wanted to have with people over the past few years. And I have, have I've had a conversation with a couple of people, you know, a um, couple of mentors. But, you know, to really get a broader um, conversation today, um, you know, we're going to talk with Fred. And we're going to just get into the the question that I I posed four years ago was, how does white America hold white America accountable when it comes to race relations? And as as a black man, I've come to understand, you know, you know, my part, my role that I play in my community and my family, you know, in in the greater context of our of our country, you know, is only is only got so it's only so big. It's only so broad. I can only reach so many people. You know, and the reality of it is, is, you know, the broader you know, population of, of white America is far, you know, mostly unreached, mostly unreached. And so, you know, those those that I come in contact with, those that are in you know, white America, I can only ask, you know, you know, those that, you know, actually live the lived experience, you know, but it leads me to the question of, you know, how does white America hold white America accountable? And I've asked this to a couple of people, a couple of men. A couple of white gentlemen um, that are part of my life. I love them. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're securely, you know, fixed in our family, <laughs> and 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 they really didn't have an answer. And but it really it it was a big question for them, and so they really pondered it. And I mean, even to this day, they still ponder the question. And so I posed that question, and um, after talking with Fred the other day, his insights. I wish we had recorded that conversation as well, because I tell you what. I mean, it's just it's just full of full of gems. But, you know, I, I, I do believe that talking with Fred is going to give people a really great, you know, um, idea and understanding so we can begin this conversation around, you know, um, you know, race relations and you know how we grow from here. So, um, Fred, I kind of want to you know throw it over to you and see um, what your thoughts are on that. Well, James, thank you for having me on. I really uh, have enjoyed getting to know you very quickly. And yes, it went places that we didn't think it was going to go. And it was kind of a God thing. So that was really neat. Um, You know, to start, I guess, um, you know, your question poses a couple realities. Um, First of all, that question um, begs the reality that white America is the authority. You see what I'm saying? And so, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and then, and I think within that question also then becomes often um, the question for white America is how is black America going to hold themselves accountable for, you know, where they're at. And I think what happens is immediately walls go up um, and both sides have this perception and there's a lot of built up, um, I think, fears um, that hinder being able to really have a good discussion about it um, because it's almost like feeling like one's attacking the other. And when we talked, you know, a couple of weeks ago, there was no sense of that for either of us. And we had never met one another uh, ever before. And we're talking about very significant racial realities. And we weren't offended. And we felt safe. We weren't feeling like the other person was trying to um, push their agenda. And and I think that's where things tend to go and it derails it. And so my hope is to to have a conversation today that that really kind of more educates um, and frames it so that we can at least have discussions instead of be fearful of things. Um, So when you raise that question, I think for most white people, and if I think... Uh, if I were honest, um, probably within two years ago, if you'd asked me that question, I would have been defensive. 
but now that I've been exposed to a couple things over the last couple of years, um, I'm not. Um, I've read some material um, that has enlightened me on some some things that in uh, in our history um, that I think we know, but we don't really acknowledge the long term effect of it. Uh, and and okay, how do we address that? And then the other dynamic is um, I've been a part of a very multicultural church in Indianapolis the last couple of years now, and I'm developing some very, very close friends, um, Black leaders that I care about. And I'm hearing things they deal with, and it's different than what I deal with. And so that, that's been enlightening for me. And so, you know, my background is in ministry. I pastored for 25 years. Um, I grew up in rural America, um, uh, small town in Ohio, um, pretty much all white. We had one black guy in our town. He was our star running back on the football team. <laughs> and that was my only exposure um, to um, diversity growing up. And what's fascinating is last year, he came to one of my son's college football games that was in Detroit. And he came to the game and we sat and talked and we hadn't talked since we were 18 years old. Okay. I'm 54. Uh -huh. and he was a year younger than me. We didn't really run with the same crowd, but he was talking to me about some things. And um, I was a little bit embarrassed that I didn't realize some of the things he dealt with. So that that's a side that I think is uh, kind of, to begin trips things up is I think for, you know, for a lot of white people, um, I think most people that especially love the Lord or they want to do the right thing, um, hate the fact that our country has a background in slavery. Yeah. Don't, don't like it. And, and it's hard to even think that, Oh my, could my relatives have been part of that? And that that's, that, that's hard to even, think of that. Um, but when I look at scripture and I look at how God works in the world, uh, what he always tries to do is he tries to help leaders be the ones to be most sensitive to what's going on in culture. And so he would send prophets in the Old Testament and the prophets were supposed to own the sins of the people. They, they were supposed to acknowledge them and and kind of on a corporate level. And what's funny is the few generations that did, because most of them didn't, um, but the few generations that did, those prophets, they would say things like, God, forgive us for our sins and you know the way we've oppressed people or things we've done wrong. And those were the generations that didn't do it, but they, but they claimed ownership of it. And, and I think there's a principle there, and that is that when leaders can own corporate um, sin or corporate um, injustices, then I think we can be open to seeing private sin or private injustices or um, um, biases that we might have. And, and, and then, then I think the other side can feel heard and not defensive and like they have a voice. So, but instead what happens is that question gets raised. White America gets a little defensive and says, well, what about the people that um, uh, are just, um, you, you know, not taking responsibility for themselves and, you know, everybody gets a chance in America. Okay, I, I hear that. But at the same time, I didn't know about redlining a year ago. And then I read a book called The Color of Law and see how for generations, um, decades, multiple decades, pretty much all of 19th century, there was a governmental um, built into the system, red lines drawn of where African-Americans could not uh, buy a home. And so the suburbs were created separate as white privileged places because um, they would not give um, mortgage brokers the deal if they chose to give them to black uh, people. They um, 
even veterans, black veterans didn't get the same rates that a white veteran would get. And so, and then they would have to try to come up with uh, a mortgage that is way higher. And we all know that one of the greatest ways to pass on wealth is through your home because it triples, quadruples in value in, in your lifetime and to pass that on to the next generation. And so in, in other words, what was happening was the ghettos were created. Um, and so the value of, you know, those homes was, were not going to increase. And, um, and even when interstates were developed, um, there were some middle-class black neighborhoods that were displaced, but white ones were not. And, and these are all documented realities. I mean, they're, they're truths. And people could say, well, we don't do it now. But the problem is once the Supreme Court said those things were wrong, well, now you've already subjugated um, an entire generation of people for the last 30 years of their life in that. And now they're starting from ground zero behind. Uh, and so my, I guess, as I read some of those things and I talk with different black leaders, I my heart then goes to, okay, well, if someone has a disadvantage, um, then we have a responsibility to help um, address that at least. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that it's a give out and somebody doesn't have to do their part too. And I think that's where it gets tripped up is that people go quickly to the, well, but you know, there's people that don't do this. And, and we all like to talk about the extreme people. Um, and we all have extremes in every group of people. But that's that's not what we're talking about right now. You know, most of the black leaders I've met, great, incredible leaders um, like yourself that um, you've pushed through a lot of things and and you've made something of yourself, even though you've had disadvantages that you had to uh, work through. Uh, and so so I, I think the discussion before we can have the discussion, we have to have a different discussion. <laughs> right, right. You know, the key thing that you said, it was a couple of key things. The first one is you read a book recently. That's that's the first thing. Um, the 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 other thing is understanding that that there's a there's a a lot of information that we you know current you know we living in 2024 you know even if we've been alive for you know 50 plus years there's a lot of information that we do not know that we were not that we didn't know that we needed to know. That we didn't know that we needed to know, and to 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 pick up on the you read some new information part myself. Now this is you know now we don't we we're, we're neither one of us are a monolith. You can't speak for all of white America. I can't speak for all of Black America. You know, but it's very you know we we but we our lived experiences highlight a lot of similarities amongst you know amongst our whole you know um, cohort of 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 Americans. And one thing that I've um, learned over the past eight years is the fact of how much I didn't know, how much I never heard, how much I didn't know I needed to know. And, and through reading a lot of different books, like, you know, The Color, color of Law, The Color of Money, Cass, you know, um, um, and go on and on and on and on. My mind has just been blown by what I didn't know. The Willie Lynch letter. I don't know if you've ever read that. Or I, I've always heard the name Willie Lynch. But I didn't, you know, I didn't, I never really knew what it was until the past just few years. Then I um, actually, um, you know, read the letter, got the letter, downloaded the red letter and um, shared it with my, my father who was alive at the time. And, and we had never heard this and shared it with my, you know, um, some of my family. We had never heard this. Just the, 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 the dynamics of, of, you know, the making of a slave and every, which blew our minds wide open, but we knew information new information, which, which caused us to go and, you know, and the benefit in my family that I can say over the past um, 12, 13, 14 years is we've done some deep dives into our family history. Um, one of my, um, my cousins, she's, um, she's um, a genealogist, you know, a, a amateur genealogist, and she's just done a lot of, you know, dynamic work going all the way back as far as she can, telling us who we are telling us where we came from, you know, you know, you know, tracking the track, naming the names, naming the counties, naming the states. You know, we started here in Kentucky, you know, in this, in this, in this, in this, this county, in this city. And there's been a lot of, um, 
there's been a lot of research done. And so we now we know more about who we are and why we are, you know, where we are in, in, in my family. And so when it comes to the conversation of, 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 of race, we've learned more in the past in my family. We've learned more in the past, you know, 14 years than we've known ever. And we take that, you know, into these conversations. You know, I've learned more personally in the past, to be honest with you, four or five years with all of these books, you know, you know, past eight years for sure, but past four or five years, I mean, which is, which has caused me to say, well, okay, James, <laughs> you just learned all this new information. You know, you just learned all this new information, you know, and, and everybody around you is just learning all this new information. You got to take a moment, you know, you know, God really put it upon my heart a couple of years ago, you know, exercising grace, mm -hmm. exercising grace. You have to exercise. You don't, you know, you know, today's great. Yesterday's grace ain't no good for today. Today you got to, you know, you know, it's new grace. You got to exercise. You got to, you, you know, on a day to day basis and exercising grace and understanding, okay, knowing what I know now, knowing what I know now about race dynamics, knowing what I know now about our country, not just about, you know, race dynamics, but about our country and, you know, economics, global economics, even, you know, it's, it's a bigger, it's a global conversation. That's the thing, you know, race relations in America is really a global conversation. Because there's 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 reasons for for all of this that leads us to here, but once I learned all this information, I was like, and then started you know, with those that were learning along with me, we we're like, this is too much information for people. People don't you know, people don't aren't going to want you know, people don't want to you know learn this much. People aren't going to want, but we have we have an obligation somehow to get this information, you know, imparted upon people and everything. And so when it comes to you know, I started looking at the data, started looking at the numbers and started looking at, you know, in the United States of America, from a population standpoint, you know, the population is shifting. That's another thing. I just finished another book earlier this year called Generations. It's the second generation. There was another Generations. Finished that book, you know, um, I think it was last year. Finished a, a new Generations book, which really had a lot of dense data, you know, just really about the numbers, you know. And I'm like, and I wrote it down and make, you know, from generation to generation, the racial dynamics are have changed massively from a number standpoint. Um, and I, I knew it a few years ago, but I didn't, you know, when you, it's one thing to have an idea, like I know something's happening, but when you actually have the data in front of you, when you actually have the metrics that you can, you know, measure and everything, like, oh. So when I asked this question four years ago, even myself, I'm getting more of a clearer picture because I have data in front of me now. I have, you know, they, I have the actual, you know, generational numbers and, 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 and culture shifts, not just, not just what we see every day when we go out to the grocery store or what have you, you know? So when I, you know, think about this question now, this is not an easy question because once you, once again, you know, I'm asking black Americans, see, I'm holding, I'm, you know, I'm having a conversation inside of black America of holding us responsible, holding us accountable. And we're having that, those conversations. And matter of fact, you, you're even seeing it kind of playing out actually in the media a lot of times. You know, we're holding ourselves accountable and we, we've got to hold ourselves accountable. You know, we've got to, you know, you know, despite the, the reality of what's occurred, you know, you know, generationally, you know, historically, we still have to, okay, you know, take all that. Okay, cool. We, now we know. Cool, great. We know how we got here. But now we know we need to fix we need to fix the, the, the ropes in our house, mm -hmm. so to say, in our, in our house, in our, in our house, on our street, in our neighborhood. You know, when I think about, you know, I'll use Indianapolis as an example. You know, my father moved us there in 1984. When I look at Indianapolis, I've seen it go through so many shifts that I can actually say, oh, wow. I remember when we got here and then it was like this for a little while and then it went like this and then it went boom and then it went, you know. And to actually to see where it's at now. So when I drive, when I come down to Indianapolis and I drive around, I tour, I always try to document as much as I can, take pictures because things are changing so much. And then some things are not changing at all. And it's like, you know, when we talk about redlining, when we talk about, I look at the, the opportunity zones. I've been doing a you know, deep dive on opportunity zones for the past five years. And I look at it and I mapped it out, you know, in Indianapolis and you know, when we follow the red lines and everything, um, we really get to see it. I, I made a couple of videos a few years ago, just me driving around through our old neighborhoods in Indianapolis, and I'm thinking about all the 
all the black businesses that used to be there when we moved here in 1984, not to mention, you know, my father growing up since 1937, you know, and he, you know, tells the story and he puts his, put in his autobiography, a lot of, you know, his journey and everything. And the picture that's painted about what he saw and the environment and the, and the, and the, you know, and it's very interesting because at that time, you know, segregation was, you know, full on, you know, you didn't, you know, you didn't go, you know, across that bridge. If you went across that bridge, we're fighting, you know, and then the stories are, you know, are very, you know, very prominent that he, that he told me and everything. He even put some of them in his autobiography, you know, but it was, it was very dynamic. Now we drive up back and forth over that bridge today, like it's nothing. I'm just going to go over here and it, they're renovating over here. And, you know, we, you know, we're not thinking about, we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. And that's the, that's the big thing. We don't know that we're driving over, you know, we're driving over a bridge that, you know, just in the past, you know, 60 years, you know, was a, was a, was a, was a drawing line that you didn't, you didn't pass it. If you were a certain color, mm -hmm. if you're a certain color, you don't go over this bridge. You don't have any reason over it. If you go over this bridge, there's some consequences, you know, there's some consequences. And so fast forward to the day, you know, we, there's a lot that we just don't know. And that's, that's really where, 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 where I'm hearing, you know, where we have to, you know, say, well, okay, there's a lot we don't, we have to intentionally, the, the intentionality here, we have to intentionally, you know, seek to know what, you know, what happened, we, you know, people are afraid of history because they're afraid to find out somebody did something. Guess what? I'm, a, you know, I'm gonna break everybody's heart here. We're born in sin. Guess what? We've done a lot of bad things. Guess what? There was a lot of killing that went on. There was a lot of robbing. There was a lot of bad things that went on through history. That's how we've gotten to this point of, you know, being a somewhat trying to be civilized, you know, <laughs> you know, um, 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 you know, civilization and everything. There's no getting away from it. You got to understand, you know, where you came from. And personally, I take, you know, I took for granted that people even wanted to know their family history. A lot of people actually kind of want to know their family history. They don't want to know. They don't want to know. You know, um, I just not got nothing to do with me. Well, yeah, it does. It has everything to do with you. It's how you got here. You know, when I learned, you know, even my name, my name is James Robert Montgomery, right? James Robert Montgomery. Okay, where'd that name come from? Well, I'm named after my grandfather. I'm named after my grandfather. Okay. Where'd that name come from? Well, it comes to find out, you know, when we find out these things, you know, we find out that 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 a slave owner, Robert Montgomery in Kentucky, owned a slave. And he, you know, let the, you know, let the slave go at a time. Well, he had he had he had a child with with a slave, with one of his slaves, and that slave was allowed to go free. Oh, okay. So now we now that I had to take a step back. I'm like, oh, okay. So what that tells me is, and we got a family tree and everything. Okay, so my slave ancestor, and my slave owner ancestor. Okay, the conversation deepens. The conversation deepens when we talk about holding one accountable. You know, oh, you know, you got to go a little deep. You got to say, well, I got to step back a little bit. Okay, now there's 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 more there's more to the story. And you know, as I learn more about my family and learn the different dynamics, I'm like, well, this everybody got more to their story, you know. And so, what we don't know, you know, is coming upon us to say, okay, we there's some things we need to find out. There's some history that we need to learn. We can't keep running from knowing. You know, we just need to let the data, let the information bear witness, you know, to, to right now. And then, you know, kind of answer to that. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, um, we all know that history tends to repeat itself when we don't um, learn the lessons from it. And so you can't learn the lesson unless you look at it. And so, you know, just... This past year, I learned about the Tulsa massacre. I'd never heard about it. I was, I was embarrassed that I didn't know about it. It was a major event, <laughs> you know, back in, I believe, the late 20s. I think it was around 1927, if I remember right. What's that? 
most of us didn't know. Yeah. So, you know, it's not in any American yeah. history, um, but it was a major, you know, thing where, you know, there was a black area of town that was called Black Wall Street. Wealthy, had lawyers, had um, financial investors, um, had um, professors, and it was a whole community uh, of people. And of course, you know, there was division back then. And and so uh, there was a situation that happened um, where supposedly um, a black boy was uh, accused of raping a white woman in a white neighborhood. And uh, it went to the court and the court um, did not find any evidence of that. And then because of the anger uh, uh, of that, the entire city got burned down, that whole area. And the police and the, you know, was supportive of it. And it destroyed an entire Black community and displaced thousands of people and um, set, you know, them back in their wealth and in, you know, what they had accumulated to pass on to the next generation. And, um, you know, I think, even just if I told that story, certain people would say, well, they deserved it because of what happened, but it wasn't, it wasn't found true. And, and everybody could have their speculation of whether there was foul play. Um, but the reality is um, that's brutal. That that's just an entire city blocks um, for a potential situation that happened that. Um, and so um you know, becoming aware of those kinds of things, um, it really shows you that the reality is human nature is to be afraid. And um, and by human nature, we don't approach each other from that grace standpoint that you were talking about. That really has to be God at work in us. Um, and so we shouldn't be surprised that there's all kinds of, you know, bad stuff that happens in our world because we're fallen people. And um, but God's people are called to live differently and to uh, be a light in the world. And I, I just share an, a story that really came home to me within the last few months. One of my dear friends that I've gotten to know at the church I go to, um, he's a very successful um, in the health industry. And uh, he's a, he's close to my age. He's a little young, I think a little younger than me, but both in our fifties and and um, he went up to a conference for his business, and it was up in northern Michigan, a town called Bel Air. It's a small town, and it has a ski resort and a PGA golf course there and a, a lot of lakes. And And um, he told me that, hey, I was just up in uh, Bel Air, Michigan at a uh, conference for my uh, weekend retreat for my business. And I was like, are you kidding me, Bel Air? That's where you know, we have a lake house and we've been going up there for 30 years. It's been in the family and, oh, we love Bel Air. And, you know, my wife and I were just, you know, talking about that. And he goes, well, my experience was a little different. And he said, you know, first of all, I was, you know, in this small town, um, but, you know, the complex, you know, has thousands of people there. And he said, I was the only black person there. And I got a lot of looks and, I felt a little uncomfortable with some of the looks and comments that people made. And immediately I went through my head and I kind of went through like 35 years of my head. And I was like, yeah, I don't remember very many uh, black people up there. So I, I just kind of was like, okay, chink, just remember that uh, as, you know, hearing it from someone else's perspective. And then he said, um, they were telling me about this great restaurant that we needed to go to called The Pearl. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I've been to it many times. It's this Cajun, you know, restaurant. And he goes, yeah, they were telling me that it's uh, out off of kind of like a dirt road, like a house. And we're going to go at night. And he said, I thought, whoa, is this a sundown town? And I was like, what's a sundown town? And again, I was embarrassed that I didn't know what a sundown town is. And so then he explained that, well, Back uh, in the days of lynchings, um, Blacks knew that there were certain towns that you made sure that you were not in when the sun went down. So they're called sundown towns because lynchings would happen in those towns. 
And once he shared that, it was like, are you kidding me? You know, Bel Air, Michigan, and all, you know, and there's kind of these thoughts of how could, you know, someone think that way about it? And and then driving home, my wife and I were talking and and I realized, you know, think about it. Are there areas of town that we wouldn't feel comfortable going in after sun goes down? Yeah, there are. Are those bad people that are going to hurt us? Probably not. Are there things that happen sometimes in those communities? Yeah, we're just afraid. It's un, it's uncomfortable. We would be the minority. And so that's a little awkward. So I, I, I thought, okay, I if I can put myself in that position, then I can see that somebody might view that uh, about this town of Bel Air. And the, the part that I, I'm starting to realize is that, you know, I grew up loving small rural America. You know, it's mainly white yeah. and I have great memories of it. But the reality is that's where most of the lynchings happened in small yeah. rural communities. And there's quite a few here in Indiana that were KKK capitals of the world. Um, you know, Elwood, Tipton area and, you know, and and other cities around. And, um, and you know, that's the um, stories of someone's grandparents. Example. And so exactly. it's not not too far off. And and so we have to learn to allow each other to have our own vantage point yeah. and not dismiss it. Exactly. And so when we can do that, then it's not a fight of I'm trying to push my agenda uh, or, you know, all of the political rhetoric that comes in. Uh, that polarizes things where we can't even have a discussion about something. Um, we need to just be able to listen and acknowledge somebody's vantage point. And then maybe we can have a healthy discussion about things. Exactly. And that's the, and that's the whole key is, is, you know, we have to hear the story. We have to hear, you know, the, what happens. I, you know, I, I, I've had to step back and understand I have a benefit. And I appreciate it. And it's a blessing. I thank God for the ability to have heard and learned from my elders some very interesting um, perspectives, especially when it comes to Indiana. Because, like I said, I have my father's perspective of growing up as a Black Hoosier. Um, then I have my father-in-law's perspective of growing up as, as you know, a white man in rural America. He's born and raised in Tipton, you know, born and raised in Tipton, pastored in Tipton, you know, pastored in Elwood. He tells me he tells me the story of when they when he moved to Elwood, the pastor, a church. And, you know, so I hear the stories. I don't, I don't know these things. I don't know. Not, you know, what's Elwood? I'm like, so, you know, but I hear the stories of, of when there were, you know, when he went to the pastor, you know, they used to have clan meetings, you know, actual clan meetings um, there on the near property. And um, when he became a pastor there, he said, no, this, you're not doing this here. You're not doing this here. He said, you know, you guys are not doing that here no more. That's not happening here anymore. And he put a stop to it. And he put a stop to it. And I'm like, that's a massive story to me. Sure. And then as I as I learned more about, you know, the histories of of of, of Elwood and, you know, Tipton and everything, I'm like, I'm like, really? You know, I went to church in Tipton for, you know, years. That's where our, you know, that's where our church was for a while, you know, but I'm being introduced to it in the 2000s, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, you know, I'm like, I'm like, oh, it's so pretty right here. You know, I'm being introduced to it, you know, at a time when all of this wasn't happening. I didn't realize the intensity of, of, of you know, the racial, the, um, the, the racial discord. But it just, it just reminds me, though, I'm like, OK, there's more to learn. Even like the movie Black Klansman came out a few years ago. Black Klansman. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but definitely watch it. Now, here's the thing. I'm born and raised in Colorado Springs. For 10 years until we, my father moved us here to Indiana, to Indianapolis. 1974, born and raised in Colorado Springs. Well, Black Klansman comes out about five or six years ago. And I'm watching it. You know, it's with um, um, Denzel Washington's son. Um, um, I think his name is James David or David James um, Washington. And I'm watching it. And I'm like, they're in Colorado Springs. In Colorado Springs. And they're investigating the Ku Klux Klan in Colorado Springs in the late 70s. I'm like, I, you know, I'm like, huh? I'm like, when? 
Colorado Springs is not that big a city. It's not it's not bigger than Indianapolis, but it's, it's a good sized city, about about four hundred thousand. You know, four hundred thousand, probably a little bit more than that now. But it's it's still you know it's it's a it's a it's a city. You know, it's a good sized city, but you still you know pretty much know your way around. You know, you know, and it's like hmm, never. I had no idea all this was going on, and they're having these, these big meetings, and they're naming places, they're naming you know, um, you know, um, like local places. I'm like, I know where that's at, and I talk to my father, and he watched it. We're like, we know where that's at. And we're like, now he was a grown man at the time, you know, and he now he'd seen like an instance on the outskirts. He'd had an instance on the outskirts where he knew that there was a clan meeting somewhere on the outskirts at one time, but there wasn't a big sense of it in the city. It wasn't a big, you know. You know, that was the only story that he had to really share with me about it, you know, and he was like, OK, stay away from there. And, you know, he went on about his business and they had their meeting or whatever, because he worked with the Urban League and in Colorado Springs. And but when we saw that movie, we we're like, we had no idea. We had no idea. And this leads into what we're saying. You know, there's so much that we we all didn't know. And that's really the biggest thing that I'm saying. Well, it, I mean, yeah. you know, the scriptures say people perish for lack of knowledge. So our ignorance, you know, it, it just causes us to produce the same thing over and over. And, and again, by nature, we're fearful of things we don't understand or know. And we throw around terms that we don't even realize why we say, well, those people are they. Well, what's that mean? <laughs> you know, why, why do we say it like that? And, and so we don't even think about Where'd that come from? That language or vernacular or, or, or that kind of stuff. And, and so I, I think we just don't understand the, um, the impact um, that everything has had. And, and we can't just dismiss and say, well, that's in the past um, because we know that it's not because um, the last five years have shown <laughs> there's still a lot of racial tension. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I, I think again, the starting point is being open and willing to learn and have conversations, not from a, here's my agenda, I'm fighting my agenda, but from a, hey, we want to understand one another. And we may still disagree on certain policy things or certain views uh, of certain things, but to be able to come at it from a unified, what is a way that we can work together on this rather than um this polarization exactly exactly yeah and as we um I'm, I'm glad that we've had this conversation this morning um i mean this is this is the this is the kind of well conversation you know we've really been building towards for the past few years and, and and more and more these are the you know we have to start with these conversations you know we have to start with these conversations we have to start with these conversations. hold on for a second more. and so probably can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Now I'm I'm on my phone, so my phone started ringing, and I'm like, ah, oh, okay. That, that always happens. But um, there's so many there's so many conversations that we that we are going to have, but we have to start with these conversations now, and we have to, you know, and, and it's ironic, you know, you would <laughs> you would think, you know, it's like, you know, I, I kind of I have a kind of a running battle in my head, like, why didn't we do this? 20, 30 years ago. Why didn't we know? Why didn't we know? That? You know, and I come to find out it's not just me that's having these, you know, internal battles. I'm like, well, there's a there's a lot, you know, and and we have a kind of a culture of we gotta find a blame for something. No, here's the thing. Take accountability for we gotta take accountability for, you know, we didn't know what we didn't know. We we couldn't have known. I mean, we didn't have this, even this technology right here. We didn't have the capability. Right. I didn't have I didn't have access to all the information. I'm listening to a 12 year old commentator last night on a, on an interview and everything. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like the whole time I'm saying he's 12. I mean, cause he's at, he has access to, you know, a lot of information. I'm listening to my, you know, my, my grandchildren, you know, seven years old, listen to them just talk. And I'm like, they have access to information when they want to know something, they just get to go, go learn it. Sure. And they don't have to, you know, Hey daddy, Hey papa, you know, how does this, you know, when I need to know something, I go ask my father. You know, I go ask my father. I didn't think to go ask nobody else. I go ask my father, you know, and we didn't know what we didn't know. We and, and the, the reality of it is, is we couldn't have known the we didn't have access to the level of information that we have access to now. 
But that being said, though, now it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we make that we that we educate ourselves. The 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 I didn't know thing. Cool, great. When we were young, we can leave it in the past. We lived this long. We didn't know what we didn't know. Today, there's literally no excuse, and we have to we have to hold ourselves to that higher standard of holding ourselves accountable to. Okay, I didn't know something. Let me go learn something, at least a little bit about something, at least to get a little bit of understanding. Well, it's similar to, we're both married. Um, it's similar to in your marriage when you become aware of something of the way you're responding that is hurting your spouse. Once you know, if you still do it, you know, well, then, then you're asking for the relationship to not go well and, and to go south. And as opposed to, oh, now it's up to me to change and respond differently um, yeah. because I value you know, this person in this relationship. And so I, I know we're kind of coming to a close um, in this and I have another meeting, but I, I want to just end by saying, uh, you know, as a, as a white leader in, I've been in ministry roles. I now own a business um, and now I do coaching to business owners um, as a person in a leadership role, and I work with a diversity of, uh, of, of people, men, women, black, white, uh, a lot of different people now. Um, a, as a person that feels like God has given me some influence uh, and my circle of influence, I, I want to just say, James, I my heart breaks for the history that you've uh, your family's been through, and it's wrong. And uh, I, I apologize for that. And I want to be part of a generation that restores things and that makes wrongs right. And um, and I'm committed to have the conversations that, well, how do we how do we move in that direction? And I have a belief that when you when you come at it from that vantage point and when you truly, uh, value and respect people uh, and believe um, something for them, people rise to what you expect of them. But if you don't, then people won't rise to what you don't expect of them. And so th that's the that's kind of the lens of the way I look at it. Not that I have to beat myself up and feel bad for it. No, not that. But to realize that, man, I, I have some influence and some opportunity to be able to be um, a positive, uh, you know, light to move it in a good direction. And um, part of that brings accountability across the board and um, and it will make all of us stronger. Um, and because and maybe on another pad podcast, we could talk about this. I've done a lot of reflecting on what are some real strengths in the white community that if we could have conversations and we could pass on some, some just information and just some way of thinking to the black community that could help them. And what are some things in the black community that the strengths that they have that they could bring to the white community. And if we were to value the strengths instead of look at the weaknesses in each other and just criticize, I really think uh, there's some things I've already named in my head that I'd love to talk about another time um, that that I think could help bridge that. Yeah. I'm going to say, well, Fred, that's going to be the next conversation. That's going to be the next podcast that we do because you just blew my mind. Um, and I want to really put it, put it, put that's, I want to pick up on that, pick up on that on another conversation because that's, I've I've never heard that. And that's, you know, we don't know that we're listening for, we're listening for things in, in culture and in conversations that, that we don't know that we need to hear until we hear them, you know, and then we like, that's it. That's the one, that's that magic. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's that other key, another key to another door, you know? So that's another key to another door. And so I appreciate you um, um, having this conversation with me this morning. Um, you know, and, and say, well, um, thanks for getting the recording. We're going to get it out and everything. And um, I, I'm really, I'm really excited about, you know, what, what God is doing right now. I'm really excited. I mean, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. You know, my facial expressions don't always do it, you know, but this is actually my excited face. 
but uh, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I kind of see it as your. Uh, I'm a football coach, and and my son plays football. I see it as your middle linebacker face. Like I'm, I'm, I'm all in. It's hilarious. I mean, that's, a, that's, my, that's, my, that's my exciting face. So you know, I'm, 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 I'm very, I'm very excited. I'm very excited about what's going on, but um, I tell you what, you have a, you have a great rest of the day, and um, you know, have a very you know great weekend. It's 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 a beautiful day out this way. Hopefully, the sun shining down there where you are. Yes. And um, thanks for having me on your podcast. Yeah. And, and James, I am excited about what you're doing with your leadership and uh, your coaching that you're doing, and um, I look forward to um, continuing the conversation. Definitely, definitely. Have a great day. All right. God bless.